Yes. Anyway, uh, thank you. Thank you. I'd like to just welcome our panelists and our participants to this uh, evening's uh, uh, book discussion, panel discussion on a very fine new book that's come out um, by uh, Ankush Agarwal and Vikas Kumar. It's, uh, if you can see this, um, Numbers in India's Periphery, the Political Economy of Government Statistics. And um, our panelists, we have a very uh, fine panel uh, this evening. Uh, one of the virtues of uh, the pandemic is that we've been able to connect pretty seamlessly when the connections are good with people from different parts of the country and the world. And uh, it's at uh, no cost. So that's really good. Um, we have Mr. G.K. Pillai, the former Union Home Secretary, who's the chairperson of the Board of Trustees of the Center for Northeast Studies and Policy Research. Um, the, the two authors, uh, co-authors, Ankush Agrawal from IIT Delhi and Vikas Kumar of Azim Premji University in Bangalore. Uh, Bano Haradu, uh, celebrated uh, conservationist, uh, Credited, credited with mobilizing support to protect and save the endangered Amur falcon, which flies in, flies in from Siberia, right? To, yeah. to nest and rest in Nagaland. The former, she's also a former editor and a former correspondent for NDTV. Uh, Via Pao, Dr. Via Pao, author most recently of the fictional When the Dust Settles, uh, by, published by Speaking Tiger who teaches at uh, Bhagat Singh College in Delhi University. Um, the Center for CNS, the Center for Northeast Studies and Policy Research is organizing such a discussion after a long time. And although we've been known for our work with the both clinics and healthcare uh, for the most vulnerable groups in Assam in uh, association with the National Health Mission, we have also over the years worked on key research issues such as governance and connectivity trade and the Act East policy, people's vision for the Northeastern region and questions of peace and dialogue. We'll start today, uh, this evening with uh, uh, the authors Ankush Agrawal and Vikas uh, uh, Kumar, who have a very uh, interesting background. They have a very data rich and strong economics background, but they've taken uh, not a leap in the dark, but a deep dive into data and they've come up with a range of stories, narratives, analysis and information that's quite extraordinary in scope and depth in their book. They've looked at uh, the focus of the work is Nagaland and population in particular and the many narratives and varying facts and figures around this as a benchmark for the book's core thesis which links deficits in data to deficits in democracy and misgovernance and lack of transparency. They'll explain or try to explain how, for example, Nagaland registered the highest All India growth in population in 81 and 2001, but this has contracted. Not only does the economy contract, but population figures also contract um, to the lowest growth rate in India in 2011. But um, uh, and uh, for those who think that inflation of figures happens just in one or two places, whether it's in Nagaland, is, is actually not so. This is well documented and uh, both uh, Vikas and Ankush have uh, done very well to show examples from uh, Europe, uh, from, from Africa, from Nigeria, um, many parts of Asia and South America. And also the recent US presidential elections has shown how government leaders are not above using strong arm methods to try and falsify, for instance, election results. So data manipulation happens in, in many countries for many reasons, uh, partly to establish power dynamics and assert the need for dominance and a greater slice of the economic pie. Um, but first, um, Let's, uh, let's start uh, with a story, uh, which will really be a short story from me, which will pick up this conversation or take this conversation off and lay the ground for 
the authors and the subsequent dis the, the, the discussion. Uh, in some years ago, uh, in 2005, 2006, I think it was, um, some of us had been asked by the Northeastern Council, NEC, to uh, do a sort of Northeast visioning uh, exercise, which uh, worked at the ground level uh, by asking people in villages uh, what their uh, vision was for themselves and for the communities and their areas um, in, in the year 2020. Well, 2020 has passed and I'm pretty sure that many of the things they said, some of them have come to pass, but many may not have. Well, while this was happening, there was something like uh, 20 odd uh, NGOs uh, in, the, in the Alliance and uh, uh, about 120 enumerators. We received a phone call from Nagaland at night. Uh, and uh, in those days, when you received a phone call at night from Nagaland, you were a bit concerned about what had happened. But the uh, enumerator uh, was asking, the surveyor was asking, you wanted 10% of households in a village for the economic survey, uh, socio-economic survey that we were doing. Well, how do you establish 10% of 19 households? And I was a bit puzzled by the question. I said, why are you asking that? He said, because we found that the census figures say in the village that we are just talking to you from, there are supposed to be 190 households and there are only 19. And this is a pattern in different districts where the uh, survey has taken place. And um, as a, you know, and when um, I had a chance to meet uh, Mr. Rio, uh, who was then chief minister and is still chief minister now, I asked him about this, this problem of statistics. And, and he said, this is a real issue because um, we are uh, about five lakh more than what we actually are. And after that, it's been, I'll tell Ankush and, and Vikas to, to tell, tell the story because um, there are many factors at play, including you know, lack of, for instance, uniformity in maps between the census uh, and the survey of India, uh, especially in areas where there are border disputes. Uh, persons are often sometimes counted twice. Um, then, in addition, no top demographer or statistician actually questioned the official figures, which were contradicting each other for years. But uh, over to you, uh, Ankush and Vikas. Uh, tell us why this book came about, how it came about, what started you on this journey. Thank you. Come in. Uh, I'm going to share my screen so that you can see the presentation the short presentation Ankush wants to make. Yes. So are you able to? Yes, yes. See my screen? Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. So here we go. I present. I have shared. Yes. Yes. Thank you. So uh, good evening. Thank you very much, Sanjoyda, for your very gracious uh, and succinct introductory remarks. Uh, we are also grateful to all the panelists, Sanjoyda and CNES, for organizing this event in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, the work on this book actually began in 2011 when uh, it was reported in the newspapers that Nagaland's uh, population has declined in absolute terms. And we happened to interview Sanjoyda after that. Uh, later, we also noted anomalies in the maps and uh, uh, NSSO surveys of the state and ended up examining a whole range of statistics for the, for the state. The existence of uh, demo, de democracy and development deficits is uh, reasonably well documented for the Northeast. But this book brings a new lens data to this debate. And it also offers a ringside view of how the people uh, view and experience the state. The focus of the book, as Sanjoda pointed out, is largely on Nagaland, but we also engage briefly with the experience of other states. Uh, uh, next slide. Yeah, if you, if you look at you know, any of the maps of Nagaland, all of them are unique. 
both the number of uh, maps incorrect maps as well as the degree of inaccuracy has actually grown after the advancements in uh, map making technologies the first key chapter actually argues that errors in maps can be attributed to political geographic factors that is demands to redraw artificial colonial borders that have divided nagar and political economic factors that is demands in the hilly nagaland for plains territory sandwiched between an evidentist insurgency and status quoist uh, neighboring states uh, kohima tries to play a balancing act which results in many maps of the state the subsequent two chapters examine the demographic somersault uh, of the state so from being the fastest growing state until 2001 uh, nagaland became the first state in the post colonial india to register a decline in population despite uh, absence of epidemic famine uh, natural calamity or any major change in its political or socio economic conditions we compared census data with other data sets such as nfcs srs gross school electorate uh, and also church registers and found that uh, there are pervasive large and growing errors in uh, in the census until 2001 internal consistency checks conducted yes. under very restrictive assumptions reveal that uh, nagaland's population was overestimated by at least 26% in 2001 uh it is actually political and economic factors rather than the conventional demographic uh, factors which explain the anomalies in the census data we found that over reporting uh, was higher in remote areas and in the areas with the demands for uh, creation of new districts and constituencies higher voting rates and lesser ethnic diversity manipulation peaked in 2001 ahead of the delimitation and subsided after 2008 when delimitation was postponed the population contracted in 2011 as there was no incentive to inflate and also because state government built a consensus for a clean census the last key chapter focuses on nsso surveys so nagaland has one of the lowest incidences of poverty and one of the highest poverty lines in all of country now a uh, high poverty line should imply a higher incidence of poverty and certainly not the lowest uh, we saw that this is an artifact of flawed sampling frames biased samples and also uh, exclusion of underdeveloped areas from the sampling frame a uh, smoothly varying head count often uh, comprises of uh, erratic sub components so in these graphs we begin with the national uh, uh, picture all india population and then go to state districts tribes and language but no matter how we slice the data errors persist uh, errors also get transmitted across the data sets and are magnified in this process uh, for instance the 14th finance commission use of flawed 2001 census data for nagaland uh, are tra uh, translated into an additional devolution of rupees 333 crore Uh, to the state which is about 80% of its uh, own tax revenue uh, since data development and democracy deficits are intertwined uh, in the country's uh, uh, geographic and social periphery legalistic and technological interventions alone cannot uh, address the data deficit the quality of nagaland's census maps and surveys cannot be improved without resolving the political problem and the subsequent growth of the economy outside the public sector to conclude statistical reforms need to recognize three things quality of data across their life cycle interconnectedness uh, between statistics and the embeddedness of data in social and political economic context vikas will now uh, uh, discuss the interface between identity and statistics Good evening, everyone. Uh, I, I'm going to argue that the Nagas are grappling with their inconclusive search for a common identity amidst the larger political conflict over constitutional federalism in the country. At stake is who is a 
Naga and what are his territorial entitlements? Until the until the political problem is resolved, the borders will remain indeterminate and the economy will remain stunted, which make capturing the public pie a lucrative economic activity. Winning numbers games and realigning borders through ethno-statistical entrepreneurship is therefore important, even though it often pits lesser Nagalands against a greater Nagaland. Uh, numbers games, as I would as you point out in the book, are in fact as old as the Naga to the Simon Commission or Fizo's plebiscite speech or the NSCN manifesto. Statistics play an important role in all of these. In fact, right from the beginning, the insurgency and counterinsurgency were weighed both in the real as well as the statistical terms. Here you see three news items from the statesmen in which the nascent Naga nationalist movement and the NEFA administration are fighting statistical battles. Uh, so uh, every, in fact, over the years, the only change that we see is that common statistics have also become important, you know, important arenas for identity, uh, identity conflicts. Every petition for a separate district or more reservation in government jobs is, is also an exercise, is also an exercise in numbers games and that mimics the arguments in the Naga peace process. I'd like to highlight a few major points in this regard and also share a few uh, key examples of the mutually constitutive relation between identity maps and statistics. Uh, to begin with, if you, know, if you look at the villages, the villages view their headcount and votes as a measure of the socio-political villages, in fact, insist on inflating numbers to maintain their historical identity as the predominant village of the area. And there are, of course, more modern uh, uh, concerns about seats in the Vidhan Sabha and, and common funds. Now, uh, now, if you come to tribes, tribes in the hill are struggling to retain assembly seats amidst growing migration to, to Dimapur and the shift in the balance of power towards settlers in the plains. Some of the tribes are also struggling until this day for tribal headquarters, which is a district where they are a majority. And then given the centrality of political power, uh, uh, tribes are also simultaneously trying to retain or at least, you know, to increase or at least maintain their seat share in the assembly assembly uh, uh, amidst, amidst changing distribution of economic and uh, 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 bureaucratic power. These conflicts have led to manipulation of census across the state, uh, uh, across the state, and, and in some places they have also led to ethnic poaching. And by this I mean, for instance, a tribe has, has, has drawn at least one village, each of three other tribes into its camp. Right. Now, there are more complex issues which are at the, there at the junction of tribe and language. The Yimchungars of, of, of uh, Twensang and Khifre are struggling to maintain the size of the community as the Sikhs are demanding a sep you know, separate recognition. Now, uh, the Sikhs say that the census records them a separate tribe. The Yimchungar response is that the tribe for a community to be a tribe, it has to have a separate language. However, the census records the kids as speakers of a dialect of Yimchungar language. The Yimchungar response, which has not received much attention in the state, has actually shaped how district gazetteers handle identity of tribes in the state as a whole. Now, the, 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 there's also a cartographic angle here. Now, one village of a tribe was allegedly renamed or erased on the official map of the state. Another tribe's border has been shifting into the traditional territory of, 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 of a neighboring tribe. 
on then then there are you know the the whole you know assam border has tribes which are trying to extend their territory into 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 the plains the most successful tribe in this regard has been intermittently accused of absorbing illegal immigrants illegal immigrants uh, and and uh, now now on the on this southern side the tribes cannot explain uh, you know, expand into manipur however the border is being hotly contested as we see in this tuku valley now the state government aids irredentism through competitive developmentalism and counter mapping along the borders ankush has already showed you a whole range of maps i am going to show you this graph in which you see that the the, that the number of households and the population size of villages in the borders on the assam you know on the uh, along the assam border is much smaller than the number of households and the population in villages in dimapur or the state as a whole now this is surprising because the plains can support more population than the hills however these are new small villages which have been formed in the disputed area and there has been a 30 year old court case in this regard as well so these so this is this is an example of competitive developmentalism where the state government is is neglecting some of the main territories and focusing on the border areas uh now uh uh now they, there are also complex cases at the interface of numbers and maps an interstate tribal conglomerate tribal conglomerate was formed in the mid 20th century to boost its size uh, but subsequent contests over over the reservation benefits among other things fragmented the community along the uh, along the interstate borders now uh now when we when we look at these identity conflicts and the and the, and the interface with statistics we are we try to argue that there is no simple solution to the data puzzles that we see some non existent tribes languages and religions have been reported in this census even though the existing ones have not been recorded or they have or they have been under documented but then but then this is not a simple you know case of majority versus minority insider versus insider versus uh, uh, outsider the the predominantly hindu kachari tribes the predominantly baptist kukki tribes and the entirely baptist trikhil nagas are all affected by undercounting and all of them are indigenous tribes and and, and so you see that in fact if you see uh, if you if see this slide uh the the population of sumi tribe has been seen has been has been high, has been highly overestimated even though the population of the speakers of sumi ki language has come down dramatically so it is and, and sumi is not is not a small tribe which can be ignored or which has been deliberately you know, suppressed so we need more nuanced understandings at the same time on the on the uh, right or now you see that there is a tribe which doesn't exist or is there there is a group of you know you know communities which are tribes which, which do not exist but then suddenly in 2000 when the year of maximum manipulation they emerge as the fifth largest tribal community in the entire state and then in 2011 their population contracts by almost 90% so we have a very complex uh, 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 you know situation in front of us and the book tries to address this i'm going to close my remarks by you know, by going back to the to to the point which which uh, uh, triggered the book in 2005 uh, i think september or december sanjay da interviewed uh, the chief minister and the chief minister ben sanjay da prodded him further that you know uh, why do why do we have this you know inflation so he says that uh uh that the seats are being transferred from the hills to dimapur which is not fair and i quote him because a non tribal area is taking seats away from naga area now uh, we have to know remember that nagas have been a majority in dimapur for a long time and even dimapur town the only unreserved seat of the state has never uh, you know elected 
uh, a purely outsider. Most of the outside, I mean, the only two outsiders who have been elected from Dimapur town, they were son-in-laws of local tribes. Right now, uh, so therefore, uh, uh, we need to we need to you know look at so, so here in this graph, you see that the that because of growing migration, the size gap between the smallest and largest countries. in the in the in the hills and plains has grown dramatically over the years and 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 because and because the delimitation was cancelled in 2008 so therefore we still continue with this in fact growing your discrepancy i'm going to argue towards the end of this remark that that while it is true that nagas continue to see themselves primarily as hill people in most tribes there has been a shift of balance of power numerically as well as economically in favor of those who have settled in the plains of of himapur the shift is most pronounced in case of the summis where where you know in which case you know a very large proportion of himapur summis can legitimately claim that their native villages are now in the plains which is which is different from other tribes where a majority still continues to trace their their native villages in the hills now the insider versus outsider conflict or the hills versus plains conflict or or, or you know, argument based on numbers is in is in our opinion merely a means of diverting attention from conflicts within and between the uh, other tribes and and how those conflicts shape identities uh, so we can take more we can we can discuss specific questions in the in the in the q and a i will now hand over the mic so to say back to sanjay dao so that he can he can invite other panel members to comment on our initial remarks as well as the book thank, thank you, you very much thank, thank you very much uh, ankush and vikas for that very precise and um, clear outline of a very complex problem in a small state you know and uh, the the issues are so diverse wide ranging as well as uh, you have to go really deep to to understand uh, what drives these these complexities i mean whether it is the question of uh, disputed borders uh, the interface of as you talked about maps and numbers Uh, and how th- all these uh, are are driving identity at at different levels of uh, both government politics uh, ethnic mobilization and uh, the uh, so called nationalistic uh, issues um so i'm going to turn now to 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 mr pillai uh, who uh, was the home secretary and as the joint secretary in northeast uh, uh, mr pillay you are really at the cutting edge of both policy making and implementation and uh, we've really heard a very uh, remarkable set of uh, analysis and stories um, how would you respond uh, to these uh, issues and the the shall we say the complexities of the issues and, and the concerns about uh, identity uh because um, you know data or good data should really lie at the heart of policy making but i think uh, as uh, somebody is held high office in this country you would probably agree that that kind of uh, robust data is is uh, still uh, something that is to be uh, found but uh, if you would uh, address uh, the panel now and we could uh, then come back to you Uh, thank you sanjay uh, first of all let me congratulate uh, uh, vikas and uh, ankush for a outstanding book i mean i would uh, really uh, welcome that it be read as by as large an audience as possible because it has a wealth of information and data about uh, nagaland and the ethnic communities as well as a lot of data about the census itself and i will possibly i'll just like to uh focus purely on how the data itself when you ask for certain data and this is what brings up what is brought out in the book 
if you are looking at, you are only doing a sampling survey of something five kilometers from a state highway or a national highway, uh, you are then going to exclude a lot of people who are much further away. And for remote areas like Nagaland, where the roads are not there in remote areas, all the population in those remote areas gets left out. Uh, incidentally, I just wanted to uh, tell that this is not something with, of this falsification of data or is not something which is uh, common or which is, you know, the uh, patented by uh, Nagas or Manipuris. Uh, just look at even in um, the heartland of India, when Punjab, when the Punjabi agitation took place and uh, they all wanted a state for the Sikhs. And you, would, you found when they did the statistics at that time, most of the Hindus in Punjab, whose mother tongue was Punjabi, all said that they were, their mother tongue was Hindi. So you suddenly had a huge drop in the Hindi population, and I mean, in the Punjabi speaking population. And then that became also the ground for which Haryana had to be formed because that was the Hindi population area, which uh, was uh, then you had so many large number of people speaking Hindi. So this happens for both political reasons. Uh, it happens uh, for electoral reasons in the sense that uh, you, you want, uh, and also for third, for the development, because you do get, as uh, Vikas mentioned, uh, Ankush mentioned, you get about 330 crores extra uh, funds, uh, which uh, uh, is not a small amount and so far as uh, the small state of Nagaland is concerned. The only problem uh, with uh, that type of uh, additional funds, because I was Joint Secretary Northeast during 1996-2001, when the first, the 2001 one census was done, and Home Secretary during 2009-2011, when the entire exercise planning and the uh, 2011 census took place. And I know as uh, an administrator, one of the biggest problems we faced when we came to uh, look at why certain elements of funds were not being spent, which were based on uh, the household surveys. Uh, very frankly, the people in, uh, I know the bureaucrats in Nagaland told me uh, in the secretary, so we cannot spend the funds because we, there are no, we have given everybody in the village, we have given houses. Indira Abbas, you know, 100% houses we have given, but I've still got funds because there's supposed to be an extra a few lakhs of population, which uh, is not there at all, because everybody has been given a house. So we can't give you know uh, somebody a second house because that doesn't uh, help. So we knew that there was a problem uh, both with the census as well as with the data uh, that uh, came about. The uh, the other thing which I wanted to uh, mention and we'll take up when we do later is that uh, in all these remote areas the data is obviously going to be suspect. The data is actually done. If you, if you, many of you who have done the census and many of you uh, who have actually filled up the census uh, questionnaire, which is a huge, it's a questionnaire that is actually filled up either by the person who, the census person coming and ticking, asking you questions and you ticking off or where they are familiar, they give it to you and you can tick off if, if uh, where they want to. And in many cases also, which we have seen also, uh, sometimes they don't even go to the uh, remote areas. They sit on the roadside itself, the census uh, staff, and sit and tick, 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 etc., and uh, show as though they've visited the village because it's too much of a bother uh, going all the way five kilometers or ten kilometers trekking to that area. They have some idea. They call maybe one, uh, the village headman or a couple of uh, uh, members of the village, and based on what data he tells, they fill up and tick mark the relevant columns. So uh, this also, uh, uh, and I think there was a recent uh, Hindi film also on the uh, census operations in the Chhattisgarh Maoist infested areas, which got a national award uh, recently. So uh, this is also there. The other thing again is again, what I, what I call as the, there's something that you think is uh, what you mean by asking a particular question. But on the ground, when they're looking at, and if you send a, a, a sometimes a, a Sumi a teacher to a Sumi village, there's a certain level of uh, way the questions are answered and it's filled in. And sometimes if you send somebody else, if you send an Ao or Angami person to a Sumi village to take questions, 
the way he uh, writes it down, it's, it's, it's quite different from what it is the other way because he's looking at it from his tribe's uh, point. And this large scale manipulation of uh, uh, data uh, has, shall I say, is been collusion with the state government. There is an obviously, there's an understanding between the enumerators and the political uh, leaders that be that this is the way you should do it. Because it's not that uh, if you have, as Sanjay mentioned, if you have 19 households and you write, you fill up 119, it's not something that he does it on his own. He's got a mandate from uh, the powers that be, the political powers that I want so many number of households and you have to come back with that many households whether there is a household or not. So uh, one aspect which perhaps Vikas can tell, uh, I remember that when I was Union Home Secretary and it came up uh, in the periphery, what action should you take against the 2001 census uh, enumerators for who actually falsified data? And I think the general consensus at that time was, look, it's 10 years old. Many of them is not worth the effort and the this thing to try and start, you know, so much of effort and money will go to find out who uh, made these and then what were the reasons why and go back again. It may be very difficult and that was not done. But in the 2011 census, uh, we were very much more strict. There was much more geospatial, uh, you know, because you had by the time you had uh, mobile phones and you had uh, geospatial data and technology to help you. You could actually see that whether the person had actually gone to that village or not could be verified. And uh, that is how the data uh, could be, uh, quality could be improved. Uh, I won't say sub it improved substantially, but uh, there are still a lot of defects which comes from the way the questions and the sampling itself is done as uh, Vikas and Ankush have pointed out. I'll stop here and uh, we'll take up when Sanjay uh, takes us around on the panel discussion. Strange, unmute myself. Um, but I have a question both before I go to Bano. I have a question for you, Ms. Pillay, and also for our authors, uh, which is uh, the falsification of data is an offense, right? Yes. Um, especially if it's done by uh, government uh, officers. Then uh, things have been falsified, whether you take uh, the case of Punjab and Haryana or you take the case, this particular case, uh, not once, but several times. Uh, so you have actually uh, a problem of uh, data that is uh, almost historical. You know, it goes over 20 years or 30 years. Uh, is anybody responsible for that? Does government have any measure of a corrective? Uh, how does, uh, for instance, uh, one thing that I do note is that, and this is something that the book says, that even some of our top demographers and statisticians just picked up on these figures without applying their minds and just analyzed it without uh, thinking. Uh, so I, I think uh, that's a question for all three of you, and then we'll move on to Bano. Yeah, I'll answer that later in the general round. I think that's... We'll take up Bano. No, I just want to get some something on this, yes. and then I'll go. So, right, so I want to uh, point out that, that you know, when, I, when I looked at, you know, the, the large number of common law countries, and I found that in no, in None of the none of these none of these common law country which are the democracies does the state use punitive measures against people falsify data because it has taken almost a century or two to build the kind of trust that we have now even a slightest you know attempt to impose punishment is going to rekindle the centuries old concerns about census or counting being an exclusively 
state uh, expansion exercise. So this is, I mean, it's only in the mid 19th century that we were able to come to transition from census being seen as the eyes of the state to something that can also help people. So if, uh, after 1960s, America has not perhaps punished any pun. Uh, India hasn't punished any pun as far as I know after 1961. And uh, so, therefore, there has been this very extreme, you know, genuine and extreme reluctance across the democratic world to, to use punitive measures. Even when they see a problem, they hope to correct it next time rather than, you know, take action now. Uh, so, I hope that gives you an in, you know, inter-country perspective of why there is some reluctance there. Um, that, 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 is very, that is very helpful. Because it's part of the whole uh, structure of building a state and uh, building confidence uh, and the word, the five letter word you use, trust, you know, as much as anything else. Bano, uh, I'd like you to come in now and uh, just mm -hmm. share your perspectives because, uh, I mean, you used a lot of data mapping when you're handling a different issue, which is the conservation of the, the Amur uh, Falcon. And I'm sure you had problems dealing with that, uh, but we're not talking about the survival of the Falcon, but we're talking about how you as a, as a journalist, a writer, uh, uh, somebody who is uh, in the field often, how you, uh, your own perspectives of what Ankush and Vikas have, have placed before all of us and uh, your responses to, to the book and what they've been thank saying you. here. Thank you, thank you. Uh, just to share a little bit further on what, what the point that we were discussing. Uh, um, the way I see it, I think there seems to be a disconnect between uh, people and data that's been collected. There is a lack of comprehension of what um, all these statistics and surveys uh, lead to. And so perhaps this is a, an underlining tone that, that contributes to uh, enumerators and statisticians having a free reign over um, data collection um, uh, in the state. Um, well, the book, I must say, um, has really uh, deepened the question of, uh, the question that has, uh, uh, I, I, I would believe, um, um, is posed of, which every Naga questions themselves, is the enigma of, of, the, of the Nagas as a, as a race, as a people, and uh, it further um, it further enhances. I mean, uh, creates more of a puzzle for us now as, as to exactly where where are we going as a people, really. And uh, um, uh, the book, I hope sincerely, uh, Vikas and uh, Ankush, will be used widely in universities and colleges and begin this uh, much needed debate on the quality of data that is needed for improving the quality of life. Of this, uh, of, of the state, and and of the people, but coming back to uh, what what my perception uh, on the ground, and why uh, things are as they are, um, at the moment, you know, the, the overshadow of issues in Nagaland has really been who is at the helm of governance, who is who is running the the government, or is there any any governance in the state, and clearly uh, we can see that. Ever since the Naga political problem, um, everything has been related to politics and numbers and the creation of um, of, of 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 the 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 notion of, of the nation of of, of Nagaland and uh, the political the political struggle the political uh, um, uh, 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 the uh, the political struggle between the the the, the parties. That are involved currently in in this has been uh, related to not so much uh, uh, it has departed a long way from the welfare for the for the people as a whole as to now it's come to uh, 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 control of power of uh, of economic their own economic survival and um, and who is going to uh, rule the roost as as it were but. Uh, this is why perhaps one of the reasons why also over the years, over the decades, very little scant attention has been paid to, uh, to studies and surveys as, as, this, as this book clearly, clearly uh, brings out that um, 
there is definitely uh, no attention paid to the quality of data that is collected uh, or, or from or from the field and policies are never formed on uh, what is what is required the, the, to respond to the needs of the people and even if there are uh, you know these central sponsored schemes that come in uh, state governments have had uh, embarrassing times they were planning uh, development commissioners have had very embarrassing uh, times at the planning commission meets uh, in the past where they had two figures one one by the central uh, sponsored scheme and one of the of the state government's uh, own uh, uh, own collection of uh, of data and so um, even if we look closely at at the manner in which uh, the state collects its or, or compiles its statistical handbook annually um, it's done very uh, uh, without much um, not much in depth uh, exercise everything as i think uh, mr pele also pointed out is there seems to be Uh, a deep understanding between the enumerators and uh, and the government as it were uh, and um, so even if we talk about um, things like fishery or piggery or which are which are ex- extremely important and livelihood um, uh, cre- creation uh, avenues for for the for the people yet uh, we'll see a huge discrepancy here and we talk about you know the creation of something as simple as fair price shops and that there needs to be a fair price shop in every village but it will be there on paper but honestly if you go to uh, all the villages there will be no fair price shop we talk about construction we will find that everything has been done on paper but when we go when we, when you when you really go to enumerate and see if things are there on the ground it's not there so really i think and uh, since every department is uh, is responsible for uh, giving out these figures to the statistical department yet all these departments will not have uh, uh, honest or even trained uh, enumerators and statisticians to help them compile these reports so at the moment it seems like i think there there really needs to be a great push a lot of discussion around this issue and we need how do we how do we uh, um, you know uh, convert this book and this all the studies of this book into a conversation into a topic or into a subject of conversation into into village councils into village development boards and i think the connection needs to be made as to how good studies good data collection is extremely important for the quality of life and improvement of uh, of life in in nagaland i'll just take one example um we all know that nagaland is an alcoholic state uh, in the sense that you know we have an alcohol related problem in almost every family but to our shame and to to the shame of the of of you know whoever is responsible in 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 the government whichever department we don't have any statistics on how many people have died over the years even if even even let's take uh, since prohibition was was uh, was uh, uh, activated or, or brought about in in nagaland how many people have died of alcohol how many uh, the age group and all this is going to seriously impact the uh, coming generation uh, what is what is the actual standard of uh, of you know important subjects such as uh, fertility rate mortality rate uh, uh just just something which is directly related to the insurgency problem which is uh, what is the exact number of the status of widows in nagaland due to insurgency or insurgent related insurgency related uh, incidents uh, what 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 is their livelihood status you know these are just some of the areas that i'm pointing out that i really feel that the government of the day and the leaders of the day really need do need to uh we have to do something to introduce them to this book and the importance of of good data collection and statistics and if it is not there what can happen and the result is clear to see uh, about the you know the development uh, non progress in uh, in nagaland and it's 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 uh, it's you know every time we we see the newspapers we see we just recently there was a headline that said that 
Nagaland is is tagged as the most decentralized uh, state in the country. Uh, you know, it is the highest decentralized uh, uh, government uh, governance state in the country. Now, if 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 decentralization is at the heart of uh, good development, surely uh, we should have been, uh, you know, uh, the premier state in in development. But today we have issues of uh, so many issues uh, which are which which need to be addressed and and definitely social social issues. Just bringing out uh, relevant uh, uh, studies on socially relevant subjects and uh, uh, to make people understand that data collection, honest, true data collection, is to our benefit. Is something I think. Uh, both the government and uh, you know organizations like yourself, uh, CNES, and institutions. I think uh, uh, it's time for these discussions to begin. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Bana, for those very, very uh, succinct and very uh, pointed remarks. I mean, I'm coming especially towards the last. Uh, issues that you raise, why aren't there, there, why isn't there enough data on substance related deaths and people who have uh, suffered from, uh, you know, the whole women who've been impacted by the violence and the um, insurgency and so on. Um, where are the statistics of that? I'm sure they're around, but they're in different places and not in any one uh, area. And I think this is really a very important uh, point that you've made and we need to really look at it because um, uh, I see that from a remark uh, uh, among from from the participants from Viva Joshi that you know the, the whole ideal of um, uh, whether it's Naga women or women in the Northeast being uh, you know very prominent and uh, equal more than equal is actually uh, not so much the case. I mean, it is there, but there is a real challenge to it because there is uh, there are there are real problems uh, in terms of domestic violence and all these other issues of um, the single women headed households, etc., which come up widow people who are widowed or people who are almost orphaned uh, by the deaths of their parents because of uh, uh, substance abuse. This has happened in a number of cases. So this is the the micro. Details tell us the real story, as you've, you've pointed out. But I have a question for you, which will park uh, for you to think about, which is really, um, does the media pay any attention to these issues apart from occasional stories? And I'm also surprised that in, in the Northeastern states, RTI is not used as much as it could be to get information from government on many of these, on these concerns. But we'll take that at a... In the, in the, in the, in the, when the questions come up. But I want to hand it over to Dr. Virpao, who is who teaches in Delhi University and is the author of a recent book on uh, uh, a fictional book, uh, When the Dust Settles. But uh, we are, I think if you look at it from the perspective of uh, somebody who is really uh, whose home is uh, technically in Manipur, but who has kin in, in Nagaland and has an academic foot, a very strong academic foot in creative foot in Delhi. You know, these perspectives you can bring together and, and share, share your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Enjoy. I think, um, let me start by saying that this is an excellent book and, uh, so once again, congratulations to Vikas and Ankush, because um, this book is very revealing of the situations in the Northeast, especially in the perspective of statistics and data and survey census and all those things which uh, are. Uh, and yet, you know, as a typical Naga, initially when I heard about this uh, book written by, uh, you know, clearly two people who are not Nagas, uh, you know, I have my you know, percentage of suspicion, why? <laughs> why are they writing this? Um, what is the purpose of it, you know? But when I read into it, they have clearly stated the purpose of why they have chosen Nagaland. 
not just by being the first state that was created after independence, but also because of the size of the state, which is quite suitable for them. So beyond the suspicion I read into it, and uh, I'm quite enthralled by the kind of research they have done, the kind of in-depth, uh, detailed research and, uh, you know, efforts they've put to bring this book about. So let me also in that same length encourage other Nagas also to read this book, uh, critically think about it, the society that we are living in, and not just as Nagas, but people from the Northeast, whoever are here. And I suppose that people will really read into this, especially the academicians need to actually engage with these issues because unless we engage with these issues which are real in the society, I think uh, development yeah, it's not it's not going to be quite something which is visible uh, for the common people particularly and uh, you know that quotation which ankush shared a while back from horowitz in fact it states a lot about uh, the current situation which we are talking about the subject of data and identity and census uh, that uh, election is a census and the census is an election i think that states a lot about what is happening in the naga society Particularly, it is about that. I mean, uh, when you collect a data, uh, I remember when I was a young boy still studying in school, I was asked to write a census of, of you know, not to name where, but, you know, people are asked to write census, concoct names, you write ghost list of families. Uh, this is all politics in one way. But I think as uh, uh, Ankush and Vikas in the book rightly states that statistics are rights of political contestations. Uh, sorry, statistics are sites of political contestations. What to count, how to count, how to use statistics. These are things which I think, I thought when I read through that, I think this is something which really points to the kind of political choices that uh, parties make, uh, you know, and also others, organizations make. But I want to just state this, um, you know, I think as I read through and then come to the end of the book, the third part is, I think, most interesting for me because it talks about the policy, policy matters. Um, because when I was reading through and also looking at and retrospecting many of the ill happenings in our society, particularly the Nanaga society, I come to realize, and this is of course not just because of the book, but this is something which has lately come to dawn, that uh, we have uh, most societies in the Northeast have not quite understood what democracy is. And I think I'm, um, I, I caught on one phrase which Vikas and Ankush used, of course in the footnote and end note actually, which they refer to as a patronage democracy, uh, which is actually quite, uh, quite uh, important for us to understand because Democracy in our side, especially in northeastern parts and especially the so smaller states, which is quite visible, especially in states like Manipur and Nagaland, is that the government monopolizes the access to basic needs and also to the services. And therefore, that is why you actually need to, you know, nowhere else you actually hear of and must voting. You know, the whole village going to vote for one candidate. I mean, this is not at all based on their uh, understanding of, of, of the person's uh, manifesto, the position of the party. It is not necessarily because of the, uh, the individuals they actually vote, sometimes they do. But this idea of en masse voting is not at all democratic in its sense. And so there are lots of questions that are brought into, um, uh, in, into, into question. There are lots of questions that are more raised in the book actually than the solutions that actually are brought about. And I think that is important because the book like this is meant to raise important questions and for others to actually engage with matters that relate to the society. And that chapter on winning, winning censuses, um, uh, I mean, of course, winning census is not an easy thing to do. And that is why they have also pointed out the, uh, the, the tribal conflict because each tribe in Nagaland wants to inflate the numbers because that means that they will get more fund, more, more, uh, more, more, perhaps more representations and all these things. And I remember as a person from Nagale, uh, from Manipur, from the northern part of uh, Manipur, Senapati district, I remember writing an article for Huffington Post uh, in 2016. Um, this was just a few months before the run up to um, the, the, the state assembly in 2017. 
and I wrote an article called Whose Manipur is it anyway? And of course, Manipur has its own problem, as you would see. There is not just the tribal uh, in contestations as you see in Nagaland, but beyond that, there is also ethnic uh, contestations. So the numbers are actually you know, built up uh, in many, many ways. And you see that uh, not just in Nagaland, but also in Manipur, you have lots of inflations of numbers. And that's the reason why many parts of the north, uh, you know, the hill districts in uh, Manipur were uh, like the census of 2011, I mean, so 2001 was uh, not accepted, even though, of course, in 2011, uh, you know, I guess with the passing of time, somehow it was taken into consideration, but still those contestations still arise. Uh, and because of the issue of delimitation, which is right here, uh, both in Nagaland and other parts, which were actually deferred in 2000, you know, to early 2000s, and now which is pending, um, which is very much something which we need to actually look at. Because uh, if you look at even Manipur, uh, you know, of course, there are examples from Nagaland, which the book has clearly referred to, because Nagaland has its own problem of, uh, of, of constituency problems. And the problem of ENPO is quite justified in that sense, because um, they are, they felt underrepresented. And I must quote to one line, which I actually borrowed from, um, uh, from the book. Actually, this, this is what they said in uh, the beginning of the book, which they said that uh, the, the flaw with India's democracy is that, and those India's democracy uh, favors the majority and justice over the justice to minorities. So let me say that again. India's democracy favors the majority over justice to the minorities. This is something which is really much played out in smaller states like Manipur and Nagaland. In Nagaland, we can see this much, very much visible, the powerful, more popular, or more or with uh, stripes with more population tend to, you know, hijack most of the, uh, you know, kind of developmental funds because they have more representations. The same thing is played out in Manipur too. You have, in fact, uh, in, in a state like Manipur, you have, uh, you know, lots of constituencies in the valley, which is the mighty dominated area, where many constituencies have only about, uh, you know, uh, 20,000 plus voter, voter banks, vote banks. But in the hills, you know, you have as high as 54, 55 uh, voter lists, I mean, electoral votes, uh, you know, so there is this much visible injustice uh, that is done to, which is referred to. So the, the whole number of whether the Maites, Maites are actually uh, the majority in Manipur is quite questionable because whether we like it or not, uh, misappropriation or misenumeration uh, or uh, inflation of all these census, statistics, data, electoral role, these are everywhere. It is a ramping thing and uh, it is played out at def different levels. Uh, because uh, it, actually what we see then is that there is a pointers to uh, the, the, the shortcomings of democracy, the understanding of dem democracy in uh, many of these things. Um, especially in the Northeast, uh, I think um, it will not be quite wrong to say that uh, many of these problems um, are because of the, the reluctance of the central government to interfere into these problems. They know it is happening, but uh, um, pardon me for saying this, but uh, the government um, was, wants to, at many points of time, look at things from a distance and wishes the problem to sustain. Because as long as the problem is sustaining, they can still play the politics. So the question I think is largely back on the central government, how they use those data, uh, the reliability of it, and yet, you know, even though you see, if you look, if you look at the whole issue of all these kind of data collection census, there is there are easy ways. To, perhaps there may be easier ways to actually clear some doubts, some you know, some some wrong uh, things which are done. Uh, maybe not necessarily wait for the next census to happen, but there are also ways to actually uh, do some corrective measures. Like uh, Vikas has already pointed out about the. The infiltration, or not, not, not quite the word, but encroachment of uh, different tribes in Dimapur. Dimapur, because that is the fertile, and also it's a sort of no man's land, because no tribe can 
uh, you know, take autonomy of, of Dimapur in that sense. And it is, of course, uh, the Dimapur town is still, of course, uh, unreserved seat. But still, all these politics that are being played out uh, by different states. And I was looking at the, the graph that, uh, was it Ankush or uh, Vikas, who showed that the, this, this uh, 2011 data showed a huge jump of people who are not aligned to many of the tribes indigenous to Nagaland. And yet, you know, there's a sharp drop in the next census. So by that time, I think perhaps uh, within that short span of time, uh, many of these people who actually did not align themselves and, you know, to, to, to some of the tribes in Nagaland may have aligned to some other tribes uh, even by that 10 years time of the census. So there's a complex matter which needs to um, be taken to another level of debate and also question uh, not just the state government, but also the, uh, the, 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 the central government, because census as such uh, is, is the affair of the Ministry of Home, as we understand. So I'll just stop there for now and maybe we can carry on with the engagement. Sorry, uh, you, the, when you put on the, when you click too often, it goes on and off, the muting and unmuting. Uh, thank you, Veer, for those, those remarks. Uh, I actually wanted to, before I open it up to questions, because I think a lot of issues here have come up, which I think Mr. Pillai, with his very rich and vast experience in government, would be able to respond to. And I'm speaking specifically of, uh, you know, the patronage democracy and, uh, the issues that you raised about uh, how, uh, I'm just looking at uh, several points about how this, so these issues are, are sites of um, political contestations, all the issues that we've, we've spoken about, including numbers, you know, and the home ministry has a very key role in all this. So, uh, Mr. Pillai, do you want to come in and then we'll go to questions? Yeah, I think uh, one thing I think which, uh, uh, I know that uh, individual small states uh, feel that they are, uh, you know, as important as, uh, say, Nagaland or Manipur, as important as Uttar Pradesh or Madhya Pradesh. But the political reality is that uh, even though on paper people may say that that's also a state, the political importance of um, many of the states in the Northeast is actually very limited. Uh, for any government in, in uh, with, with possible exception of Assam. So to that extent, when these small differences which take place in terms of, uh, you know, a few lakhs or a few thousand, 10,000 here or there, it really doesn't make any difference. As for, for the top policy makers in, in Delhi, uh, this is a small little, uh, shall I say, um, it's a wrong word to use. It's a small little irritation that they hope to go away. And that is why in many cases, they, you know, they have, oh, you got a problem, what is your problem? Some little, give a little bit of funds and uh, money is given uh, at the drop of a hat. It, and then the problem is settled for another few months or more. Uh, the political issues are really, doesn't really uh, interest anybody here because whether you, you know, uh, uh, Semas and, uh, or Aos and Angamis or, you know, uh, Mon or Konyaks and so on, between the differences between the two, even today, if I may want to put it, bulk of the politicians in Delhi or bulk of the members of parliament will not know even the names of all the tribes uh, in Nagaland. They don't just Naga as one, one particular uh, issue. And therefore, the Many of these things are seen uh, politically as, you know, uh, uh, something wrong which is being done. You know, in Nagaland, I mean, Barno will know that you are saying that during every election, I mean, people may say and criticize and shout and everything, etc. But when the come elections, every single Naga votes for the person perhaps who is the most corrupt or who gives the most money in that area. Mm -hmm. And then they forget about it. Then the next five years, they say, okay, I've, I've got my 10,000 rupees or 4,000 rupees 
from the politician and then i don't i'm not really bother what he does next 5 years you know mr probably think the rest of the money so this is continuing again and again and we have don't have that such a strong uh, civil society where people can overrule a village council chief or a village this who says that n this n mass voting is very very difficult say in, in many parts of india you won't get 100% voting in any any particular village in india um, you can get a boycott sometimes with this threat which happened even in uh, in 91 i remember a particular village where i was election observer we found a particular man who was very powerful man he had you know rigged the elections so i had to cancel the elections and repoll was ordered and the repoll was ordered by the time the the goons of the powers that be had threatened everybody that if you go and vote in the elections you will be killed so the next when the repoll was held the election vote was zero nobody came to vote even the opposition candidate even he didn't come to vote but i mean he, he might have got 60% of the votes 40% would have gone to the opposition or 70 30 but he wanted 100 100% of the votes or nothing so he he was willing to spite you know lose that 70% of the votes just to demonstrate that this is my area this is my village how dare anybody order a repoll that is the message that he we wanted to put it he may lose 70% of the votes but doesn't matter he send that message across his society and this is something which is happening even in nagaland that people are nobody can go against the dictates of the village council or the chiefs who have decided all of you will vote for this because if they vote against and majority voted for somebody else who the council had said to vote there will be all sorts of other repercussions and societal repercussions which nobody wants to because the community and the clan is so strong and so uh, tight that they don't want to do that so these are the type of issues which uh, uh in the in the government of india perspective it's a very small issue if the problem is not there uh, you wouldn't even you, you wouldn't even find anybody looking that way sure that's an interesting uh, that's a very interesting perspective i mean i'm i'm sure our panelists have responses to that but i'll just want to take a few quick questions because i'm also conscious of the time um viva joshi has a bunch of questions uh, dr viva joshi but i'm going to pick on one which is would you say that deliberate misreporting is also a form of dissent that's one and um, then there is another question which has come uh, from uh, where are we um oko what is your opinion on um, oh. can you see this uh, what is your opinion on generalization of findings even with all the technologies of data capturing there are a couple of other questions from viva but i thought we'll uh, we'll start with uh, these two and whoever from the panel wants to take it uh, the first question is whether um, exaggeration or misrepresentation whatever it is is also a form of uh, of dissent and the the second is uh, the issue of uh, continuing problems uh, despite uh, technologies of de- data capturing no, who wants i just put a quick maybe, it, it maybe, i at least i just said two sentences uh, i don't think del- this deliberate misrepresentation is not a form of dissent it is a collusion between the powers that be and the enumerator and when they go to the village uh, even though the village people are there uh, the putting of fictional households and additional additions to the families are sort of told that look if you have a family of five look we are putting eight eight people in your family and you know you get little extra money if they are going to get some that little extra money they don't mind if the records are falsified so that is a collusion and not a form of dissent at all Okay. Yeah, I think I would I would agree also with Mr. Pillai, uh, because uh, everybody you know the numbers game has been played so uh, so 
so intensely in nagaland uh, starting with um, what the book also states uh, you know the the plebiscite and uh, of course you now uh, there are questions being raised as to the plebiscite how extensive was it but i um, i wouldn't get into that discussion now because it would raise a whole lot of other other issues but uh i think um in in a there is no form of dissent i think it's more like a uh how to make the most of it how to get the uh, how to maximize the opportunity uh when it comes to uh you know um, statistics and collection of data so that uh the village or the the council and his henchmen uh will make the most and um over the years actually Uh, you know this this on mass voting is also changing very rapidly in nagaland the the village council or the village development board in, in fact all villages um have become very very politicized and uh, there is extreme uh, 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 divisions in the village even over the the election or selection of a village chairman so numbers have really uh, uh people people have uh, the naga polity the naga population has really begun to understand the the uh, the, the significance of of numbers and how to use that to their advantage and sadly the fallout has been um, uh what what nobody is looking at is uh what will be the the actual gain what will they have remaining in their hands after you know Uh, but there's just so many issues one of the things when we normally we always say that even during elections uh, uh you know when people get money the highest bidder gets gets the votes but if you really look at the ground in 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 why this is happening you will find that many families there are families who have never seen 5000 rupees in their hands they probably never seen 2000 they've never held 2000 rupees in their hands women or uh, house uh, you know uh, um leaders of households so when that money comes into their hand at that time during the elections automatically everything every ideology every understanding of democracy and governance and you know government and what the mla will bring for them it just doesn't matter for them they have that 5000 rupees in 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 their home right now so it's the even after 5 years of you know uh, statehood if i mean 50 50 years of statehood there seems uh, there still needs to be a lot of education on what is what are governments and what is governance and what we should expect from our, our public leaders yeah. but i think there at the one level there is also <clears throat> a sense of dissent if you look at more uh, nationalist groups uh, i think ankush and uh, vikas also have actually brought in uh, the the opinions of the undergrounds and also in fact uh, student student bodies like nsf you know they themselves have quite resisted the adar or the the unique identity that uh, is meant to be linked to all these things because they they want an inflated number so that uh, it plays to their advantage that is also part and parcel of it but at the same time you know be, besides that i think what um, i must uh, thank uh, mr pillai for being quite honest Uh, in the earlier statement he made about how uh, how the the central government couldn't care about all these small states and i think that that's the same apathy which is at work in our in the northeast which is why the central doesn't really care about all these small states it doesn't matter whether it's gone or there i think that's the kind of attitude which is still at play and that is why it is only compounding the problems that are in the states smaller states of the northeast i i think the I'd question like to... of uh, the um, digital disparity <laughs> and the problems uh, that they still remain uh, because you tried to you answer yeah. that i But first I tried like... to say a short thing on the dissent issue yeah please go ahead if you permit he in india until 1981 we had you know instances of your dissent being 
reflected in data collection but almost all those instances were about more about boycott of the you know uh, data collection or the disruption of that with the with the onset in the late 80s and the liberalization of the economy that changed and you no longer had boycott calls in fact after late 80s insurgent groups from kashmir to to say manipur they started interfering in the census to support their favorite group so therefore it has changed so if there there indeed was you know dissent at one point of time in the in the agayas however that was before 1990s and that almost always meant boycott or interruption of the activity in fact the nnc also tried to carry out its own census saying that that our census is for ultimate but they could never you know complete that act, uh, activity so i think uh, uh, the 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 dissent issue has to be divided into time uh, you know different times and then analyze separately for the pre and post liberalization period yeah but i would say that um, uh, dissent still uh, remains a major force of uh, expressing uh, yes uh, shall you say uh, a non uh, collaboration with the process whether it was in the 80s with the assam election in 1980 83 and then again with the 81 boycott of the census in assam i mean that so some of the many many of the issues that have come up in assam are, are party due to that uh, period um but i would like to uh, go to a question that's from athis uh, to ankush and vikas have you checked on the correlation between the increased decrease of the population numbers and the insurgency and has there been an impact because of the peace process um who would uh, i mean ankush and uh, rikas that's addressed to you but i'm sure others could also try but for, why don't the two of you respond to it first i'll just briefly say something and then ankush will expand on that that we looked at the correlation and we found that the that the fatality that the insurgency intensity of insurgency had had decreased substantially before the 2001 census so and we see this and we see that the that this that this you know meant that 2001 census was conducted in a lot more the comparatively peaceful conditions than say 1991 or 1961 or 71 census when indeed some officials had to lose their lives you know in the process of conducting census even so 2001 census was conducted in a in a comparatively peaceful uh, thing uh, ankush can also say something on the uh, the nsso the part of it as well you know pretty seen there uh, yeah so can i first add a few lines on uh, an earlier question which got missed out by oku generalization of finding yes yes please okay, okay. see statistically speaking your findings are likely to be generalizable if your data quality is good which means your data is representative statistically speaking and the methodology so for instance if you have used any method for estimation etc then that is like theoretically correct now that said the purpose of uh, you know fair our purpose has not been to make you know uh, generalizable findings but what we actually learned was that the context is very important so it is it is extremely important to look at the context within which the statistics get generated and uh, so some of these findings are of course uh, are likely to be generalized to other states which have similar kind of socio economic and political conditions uh, with regard to the second question yes we did look at uh, this uh, part now the problem in nagaland with regard to nsso is there is a abrupt change in the nsso sample which actually, which actually didn't allow one to you know calculate this correlation so we had looked at this for jammu and kashmir and we find a significant correlation between uh, uh, between you know so they, it also faces a similar issue of a very low poverty rate and high poverty line and it is actually correlated with the period when uh, when, when the state faced maximum amount of insurgency or deaths as vikas was pointing out we are using uh, the proxy for the the extent of insurgency 
but in nagaland's case this is not very clear because all of a sudden from 70% uh, non coverage in nsso sample to to, to 0% so it is a uh, it's a uh, it's doing uh, you know a bit of injustice to that technique correlation you know if we actually use that and try to infer something but we have only shown a graph in the book i just said a short sentence here sanjeev that that you know that that the very fact that the correlation that ankush is pointing out is extremely that there are sharp changes is because of the faulty nature of the census data is partly because of the faulty nature of the census data that the nss uses as sampling frame so, okay. so these two data sets that these two errors are interconnected in a way so the 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 fault line shall we say or the faultiness is <clears throat> multi dimensional and uh, cross cuts cuts across state and and central shall we say divergences uh, <clears throat> i know we are uh, really out of time now but i would like to and i know there are a few other questions but we don't have time for that perhaps you could send um, uh, these uh, we can e i hope the persons to whom these are engaged uh, the uh, questions i address can respond to them uh, by email uh, but uh, i have uh, one request which is that uh, if the three the three panelists and uh, the authors have one sentence each they'd like to close with i'd be very very grateful and then we'll have uh, we'll ha be able to uh, close our our conversation So I'll start from the last first, which is uh, Vio, uh, a couple of sentences, then Bano, then Mr. Pillay, and then uh, uh, Vikas and Ankush. Yeah, no, <clears throat> just to say that overall the book is an eye opener um, to the flaws and the errors and the misappropriation of data, uh, census statistics, and all those things, which is very important for us to actually study. And as uh, in my address would particularly for. people like me in the academia who should actually engage in this uh, more intensely because this would matter in uh, how we see the development and politics being played in the states because sometimes at times you know people the common people are just pawns in the hands of not just the political people political groups in the state but largely you know the center is largely playing with all this thank you um i did have something in mind to share and now it's completely gone off my head but i do want to say a big thank you to vikas and uh, ankush for what you have done and uh, uh i sincerely hope that you know uh, this book will be used widely and uh, it will it will spark uh, a new line of thinking and as somebody said that to me uh, this this afternoon that you know uh, books like this uh, need to go into the hands of of the young people in nagaland so that hopefully in the coming next generation there will be some changes uh, on the ground so i i that's that's my hope and i communicate that hope to both the authors thank you for having me here this evening good luck Yeah, I would really put. Uh, I think it's a great book, but uh, it's uh, over three three seventy three eighty pages. Uh, it's not going to be read by the ordinary person who is going to read a small uh, book on fiction and so on. So I think what you have to do, I think it's a suggestion for Vikas and Nankush. You might have to pick out some. I put it as ten or twenty or thirty issues or questions which arise out of this book, and then say that this. book is about these issues and how they need to be tackled and if you can put that and that could be then circulated to the northeast nehu and you know iit guwahati and nagaland uh, central university and state universities and so on in different parts then they could generate a discussion on 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 these issues because otherwise uh, you will find that many people will not go through this book because if uh, it is not uh, it, it's easy reading it in one sense for those who know about it but it's not easy reading for the general common public ankush uh, yeah thank you sanjay so 
basically i'll tell my learnings from this book uh, so i am trained in econometrics data statistics quantitative economics but what i actually learned through this study was it is extremely important to pay very close attention to the context within which statistics are generated so for instance you know if india's growth rate is 6.4% it could well be a cooked up number because of some uh, sort of perverse incentive or it could actually indicate that india gdp has grown 6.4% which was last year so that knowledge uh, will actually come from the from a closer study of the uh, context thank you i like to say two things the first thing is in response to mr pillay's uh, uh, question that is there a mandate for this kind of manipulation as far as i can see uh, i mean we have interviewed three chief ministers and uh, so, uh, several senior politicians and uh, nowhere we got any hint at all that this was that this was a politically determined from the top in fact you game you know i have written a paper in in game theory showing how people you know, uncoordinated action on the grassroots can lead to such macro uh, outcomes there are other states in the country where it has happened from the top it has happened in goa it has happened in punjab and it has perhaps happened in kashmir as well but in this case i don't think we can blame the politicians for for direct interference here though after the fact they may have benefited by 300 plus crores and and that thing happened the, the second thing i want to say is that while it is entirely true that a lot of manipulation is happening to corner more resources etc i we have tried to think of this thing from the perspective of somebody in remote khifre or or you know or or you know own this person knows that the money or funds or food that is going to come there will be first cut of the corrupt bureaucrats and then there will be second cut of the insurgents who are going to come 25% right and then there is this uncertainty that it will come once in four or five months instead of every month so he thinks that because i have to anyway pay 25% to them 25% to them let me overstate my numbers so at least i'll get something for my family at the end of the day i'm just trying to think i'm not saying that this is necessarily true in all the contexts but there are cases where people are really staying at the level of subsistence and this and this you know uh, uh, um, you know uh, uh, you know uh, uh, food that it get from pds is often is often the game changer in terms of the nutrition so perhaps ex- times they have a rational you know calculation in the midst of all this uncertainty to some of cushion their families i'm just we are suggesting as a closing remark San- sanjay you are muted sorry 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 i think the for me the key takeaway is that how much hunger there is for this kind of information to be disseminated across uh, not just nagaland but across the northeast and i think we would really like to help in uh, uh, you know enabling that uh, to uh, take place um i will uh, i would like to close the the session by th- by thanking everybody the participants the panelists the authors for this for this remarkable book uh, and i think uh, bano uh, as uh, journalists or people who believe in the media and information right to expression and we need to get this out i see raymond is there from sri lanka and i i wish we can get it out extensively through the media and uh, the question i always have uh, is why isn't rti used as much as it could be to ex- extract information which the government can easily give there's some information the government quick, won't give quick interjection But, uh, on that sanjoy nagaland yeah nagaland nagaland was stated a report stated nagaland is the is is among the small category states it has recorded almost the highest number of rti cases 20 almost 25000 but as far as i uh, in between uh, 2006 uh, and 2017 and that's like the whole number of years but 20 almost 25000 uh, 
uh, RTI cases. But as far as I know, uh, most of these cases are not, uh, most of these are uh, interpersonal, uh, individual cases dealing with uh, property and so on. Uh, it's not so much on uh, government, uh, you know, the use of government schemes and funds. So that's also another interesting factor. Probably, you know, what we, what we uh, talked of earlier, patronage, democracy, and so you know, uh, you know, some somebody's in-law or somebody's uh, cousin is is the director of some department, or so therefore everybody just stays away from questioning the usage of of, of the of the funds. But uh, just to let you know that uh, amongst the small category states in 2018, 19, I think Nagaland emerged as the highest uh, as a state with the highest number of RTI cases. So RTI is being used, but to what what well, thank you for that. The question is, uh, I often ask uh, my colleagues in the media whether uh, media people use RTI because it is uh, actually a good source of information. It's a bit slower than usual in terms of you don't get it right away. But if you if you get the information, it will be authentic as far as possible. Uh, otherwise, there's a, because there's a penalty for the information officer if he doesn't give the right information. So it seems to me that that is perhaps a, a way of taking it forward in terms of making it much more focused and uh, robust. But I want to thank everybody for, for taking part, uh, the participants and uh, the uh, uh, panelists, and uh, really look forward to more conversations on this. And you, Vikas and Ankush, you have very clear suggestions uh, from both Minister Pillay, Viva Joshi, and others on how this can be disseminated extensively across across uh, Nagaland, across the Northeast. I think uh, if we can have a series of uh, publications uh, which would uh, reach a larger audience. So thank you all very much for taking the time this evening and Monday evening. And uh, I wish, I should have said this at the beginning, I wish you all a, a very good and good new year. And I uh, hope it's uh, full of wellness and productivity and chill again when it comes and uh, that you and all your close ones stay safe and well. So thank you, thank you all very much for, for being part of this process. And thank you Vikas and Ankush for being uh, the spark that uh, enabled this process to take place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Yeah.